All right. Cool. Yeah, no, great to, great to have you guys here. Uh, excited to chat with Dan today on our AMA series. We're going to be talking about failure and everything, uh, all the ins and outs around it. Um, we keep these, you know, pretty conversational discussions too. I'll ask some questions. Uh, Steve, Joe, anybody else that joins us can jump in at any time with questions too. And, uh, you know, it's just a, yeah, it's a chat to get to know all of our exciting experts and community members. So yeah, I think this is our, Steve, what is this, our fourth, uh, fourth AMA? Um, yeah, we're, we're stacking them up. Doing there we really go. Well. Now we have Dan the man. So, I mean, we're really starting to upgrade the, you know, like. <laughs> upgrade. Wow. Oh, yeah. Upgrade to failure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, you know, always enjoy our chats. Great to just have you on our clubhouse chat right before this. So um, yeah, if you want to give a quick intro on what learn to scale is, and um, I know you've had some transformations in the business there too. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely looking forward to our chat here. freeze yeah. and i came from an hr and training and learning and development background and so i wanted to build a business around enabling small organizations to build the types of structures and the functions so that people could feel engaged they could feel like they have a future they have a manager who cares about them all that great stuff and through many failures uh that has now changed to helping entrepreneurs and businesses develop sales pipeline, Whew. big change, <laughs> big changes. But uh, at the core of it, you know, I come from a learning background. So failure it is this like negatively charged word, but it is just critical to the learning process. And so the way that I interpret failure, the way my business interprets failure is a very positive activity because there's always something to learn out of it to make us better, to move us forward. And so you know, my business now has changed quite a bit, and I'd be happy to talk a bit about that journey and the many failures along the way. But one of the, the mainstays through this whole evolution is that I also do a podcast with my co-host, Alicia, and we interview people about their failures. So we have a whole library of other people's failures <laughs> where we sit down, we have conversations about what went wrong, why did it go wrong, what did you learn, what changed, what's your new perspective on, on what happened? And so through those conversations has given us a really cool kind of broad set of principles and kind of themes that we see in, in failures and just makes failures so much more fun to talk about. So it's a little bit about me. Um, I'm happy to answer anything or just narrate. So Jason, why don't you take the mic first? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I mean, no, I think that's a great, great perspective there. And so like a lot of times, uh, you know, we'll sugarcoat it and use, um, this is, it's not a failure. It's just a pivot. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, you have the same company now. Um, like, like, you know, you mentioned there's a couple of failures along the way, but you just pivoted to a new direction. So mm -hmm. yeah. How do you, how do you think about that model? And like, um, you know, constantly testing and it sounds like, you know, you have a pretty positive spin on like just testing as early as often and, you know, failing along the way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I give you credit to my mom to giving me an ego that, that loves failure. Um, I think, you know, it's not even so much that I set up experiments is that I approach everything as an experiment. So everything is an opportunity to get something right and get something wrong. Um, recently I came across a framework, which I, I thought was so cute. And I put it in my newsletter last week. It was a triangle square circle model for reflecting on things. And so let me kind of like break this down because I thought it was really practical. Uh, one of the things I definitely want to talk about today. So triangle. So when you think back about an experience, whether positive or negative, what are three things that are worth remembering? What are three points of that triangle? Three things that was notable, that you want to remember, that was key, that was instrumental, whatever you want. Pick three things. Then there's a, a square. What's something about the experience that squares with your, 
your assumptions about the world. So what either reinforced something you already believed or helped kind of like solidify some of the hypotheses or, or ways that you interpret the world. So that's the square. It's like, what's squares? And then the third is the circle. And the, the story is like, what's still circling around your head? What is still like causing you to think in a new way or giving you a point of reflection or, or changing your interpretation of the world? And so the, the summarization, the reinforce your previously held beliefs and challenge your previously held beliefs is just a really healthy, productive way of approaching failure. So like, what were three things worth learning from this experience? What was true? or what you know, reaffirmed my original hypothesis or is still true? And what did I learn from this? What caused me to change, pivot, uh, move in a new direction? So a short little framework. I thought it was so cute. It came across it the other day. I love that. <clears throat> um, no, that sounds great. Yeah, I know you have like, from some of our other discussions, you know, you have a lot of different techniques from um, what you had mentioned on the, you know, on that framework to the marbles, uh, keeping track of your tasks. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you want to share a little bit about like, um, you know, some of the, some of the unique techniques you have to, um, keep everything going in the right direction. Yeah. So I think, you know, no matter how you approach life, whether you approach it, uh, with a very kind of positive mindset that failure is going to happen, you're going to move through it, or that life is really hard and how are you going to make, you know, make ends meet. Um, your techniques, the methodology that you develop are tools you add to your tool belt. So any chance that you get to learn something new, either how to do something or how to look at something, then it's going to help you process the world as we kind of like live through it. And so, you know, talking about the marbles technique, I, uh, one of the techniques I've learned is taking something intangible, like a task and making it tangible. So, you know, one of the things that I do is I generate leads. I generate new business. And the way I do that is I do outreach. So I reach out to strangers and say, hey, I'm Dan. This is what I do. I help people like this. Is this something that you'd be interested in, et cetera, et cetera. And let me tell you, you fail a lot when you're doing outbound sales and outbound sales. Um, but I knew that outbound sales happens at a scale. It's not just one message that suddenly unlocks the world. And you're going to come across a lot of rejection, a lot of uh, negative feedback or no feedback at all. So having a technique like the jar of marbles is one way of moving through that failure. And the way I do it is I, I set a goal in a pile of marbles and then I say, I got to fill the jar and then I'm done. And so I'm going to send this many cold outreach and it's going to go into the jar. And when the jar is full, then I'm done. And so each individual failure is less intimidating because there's one big goal that I'm trying to achieve here. So failure is gonna happen. Like there's plenty of marbles here, but the goal is something I have control over. And that's something that afterwards, whether nobody responded or somebody did, then it helps me move forward and learn from the experiences. I sent out 20 messages and nobody responded. Well, gee, what could I do differently? And then iterate and improve technique here yeah oh, i got great. many more marbles too <laughs> this is for like big goals <laughs> I have a question yeah. have you ever lost any of the marbles i lose my marbles every day steve every day i lose marbles um like fortunately marbles are cheap <laughs> nice thanks marbles are very cheap and you know what uh i originally heard it heard this technique in some book and they're using paper clips as the metaphor. So you just buy a box of like 200 paper clips. You don't need to have marbles, but I like marbles because I'm more tactile. So it's more fun that way. <laughs> what else you got for me? Oh, and then, <clears throat> I mean, on your podcast and I, I like the, um, the idea you're doing interviews, learning from other people's failures as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, what are some of the things that have stood out in the interviews you've had so far from other people's failures you're looking to <clears throat> apply and learn from in your own businesses? Yeah, this is this is a great question because uh, we're wrapping up season three right now. So uh, we were going to do it this week, but frankly, there's a conference going on. We're too busy and it's our podcast. We can do what we want next week. We're going to sit down and do a full season wrap of this past season of failure stories. 
And this season, we had some, some really awesome guests come in and talk about um, some of the failures that they had. And they come from all walks of life, but their failures are eerily sim similar. So, I mean, when you think about failure, you would think that the uh, commander of US Cyber Command has some pretty epic failures. Um, and she does. But when we interviewed Candace Frost on our episode, on our series, she talked about her marriage and how the demands of her job caused her to miss the red flags about her marriage falling apart until she was in a bunker in Afghanistan with like rockets coming down saying like, oh, my marriage is over. And it was a unique setting, but it's a timeless story, a tale as old as time. Um, and we talked to other people whose relationships ended and how the unique circumstances of, of just whatever life you're in showcase that particular failure. Uh, one of my more favorite recent episodes, we interviewed James Hayden. James um, was working as, at his dream job right after college, which was kind of unheard of. And he bought a house and everything was great, but the job just wasn't feeling right for some reason or another, and he couldn't put his finger on it. And eventually the job said, hey, you're never going to get promoted here, so you might as well quit. And he took that and he sat down and started to write. And he started to write about the thing that he never really talked about, which was his stuttering. So he is a person who stutters and he never really acknowledged it in a way that was pro-social, in a way that like had some kind of meat behind about analyzing like what it made him feel, how did it impact him? And even though he was getting fired from his dream job, he opened up this whole new opportunity for stuttering advocacy. And he would have never found that if he wasn't going to be fired from the dream job with a mortgage and, and all this other stuff going on. And so that, that story, what it tells me is that there are things in our lives that we kind of like hide or, 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 or imagine are not really that big deal to us. And we, we minimize it or we ignore it, but when we're given the space through failure, when we're given the opportunities that failure has to reset your thinking and reapproach life, suddenly those things in the background become your foreground and you find out that it brings you more meaning and purpose than what you had thought you needed to be doing. It was a, it was a fun episode. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's amazing. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, that, leads to another question here too of um you know i think we're both or we're both in a space where we're working to help other companies and um you know we've seen problems that you might call them failures or you might just you know call them problems that are out there in the world that you know you're trying to help solve now and um so like what are some of those uh failures with the current current model in the current world that you're trying to solve with learn to scale here oh man there's there's so many challenges i mean there's the the challenge is endemic to being a business so where do you get leads how do you get sales how do you develop your product how do you get to reach more people how do you get funding all those are problems that need to be solved but fortunately they are solvable problems you're probably going to fail a couple times when you're trying to figure that out but it's still it's still going to be a solvable problem um the types of problems that I see a lot of other startups and organizations face, which inspired me to take this lead generation direction was there's a lot of intimidation with failure. I think there's a lot of confidence that gets questioned when you put yourself in awkward, vulnerable positions. And one of the places that it always shows up with, with companies is how do you advertise yourself? How do you reach new audiences? How do you speak candidly and confidently about helping others with your product or service. That thing terrifies a lot of people. And that's, that's why I pivoted my business towards solving that type of pain. And, you know, my service, what we do is we do outbound lead generation on LinkedIn, cold calls and cold emails, because these are the things that are most intimidating. And my dog Roman noodles is, is joining this conversation. Um, yeah, he's, he's the boss. He's my, he's actually my therapist. I'm going to talk a little bit about like my dog is my therapist um, because he's somebody who doesn't judge. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why learn to scale focused on that, that sales pipeline, because there's so much failure that happens in it and it keeps people from getting started. And where I see an opportunity is helping people get started by doing it for them and teaching them how to do it well. And so that's, that's where learn to scale pivoted from 
from the HR coaching consulting world, which I was what, three, six months ago. I love, love the story there and I love to see your therapist in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody um, loves Roman noodles. Roman noodles. He's the best. He's my chief rough officer. <laughs> and we have two chief marketing officers that are prepared for BC, so we should plan some kind of a summit. Yeah, they get together, they can you know, talk the about bones. Of, yeah, exactly. Things to chew. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I'll leave it. Uh, I mean, happy to ask more questions, but yeah, I'll turn it over if Steve or Joe have any questions here as well. I know Joe has questions. Go right ahead, Joe. Dan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. I was had to unmute there. Anyway, so one, uh, the point out of what Steve said earlier, you are an upgrade because so far you're the only one that has the big, you know, the uh, audio uh, platform there. So you are like the professional. And Thank so you. I greatly appreciate that. And uh, the second thing I want to say about what Steve said uh, about your uh, therapist. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you do have a therapist because when Jason's dog comes up, it's, you know, his dog's always barking at him and go like this. It's like, really? Did you just say that, Jason? And mm -hmm. so I'd rather have a therapist as, instead of a, a critique dog like, like he has. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, as, as Jason was referring earlier about pivoting, and uh, I think you know, Jason and Steve helped me pivot so much. I think I've gone circles like three times. So that's how many <laughs> times I've, I've, I've pivoted. And uh, no, I'm just, just kidding. Uh, but uh, Jason and Steve is, 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 is good people. And I actually look forward to uh, failure uh, because you're talking about failure. People are afraid to make mistakes. I'm always trying to push the envelope because I'm always trying to learn. And mm -hmm. one thing that Steve and Jason knows about me, I'm always learning. I'm always trying to uh, try to picture it. And as what you said, going in, what do you expect? I expect this. Did that happen? No. Why did not happen? Try to evaluate it and then try to make it better. And I think that has to do with the, the engineering part of me because I did a lot of research and development over the years. And so we're always saying, this is, if we do this, this should be our outcome. And, and it's like, well, if that wasn't even close to our outcome, why not? And so we have to keep tweaking, keep keep tweaking you know the the procedure until we get mm -hmm. a satisfactory outcome and but however your satisfactory outcome may not be the outcome that you were trying to shoot for it could be something satisfactory or something even better and but if you don't take a chance and as you said fail all the time and uh, mm -hmm. yeah I fail a lot and even in this road uh, because as Jason and Steve know I'm, I'm a new startup and I'm just trying to get my bearings sometimes. And it's, it's hard to get your bearings, and even with great mm -hmm. help and great assistance, because you have so many things. And I know what I know how to do very well. The rest of the stuff of business, <laughs> it's like a crapshoot. It's like, <laughs> Jason, get, <laughs> no, it is. Jason says, hey, you should be you know, worried about this. I look at it. Uh, okay, that's nice. And, you know, I'm like, I don't really understand, or Steve says something like this, or some of the other people. <laughs> and you try to absorb it and try to learn it, but it, to really master it, it'll take years. So that's mm -hmm. like it has to depend on people that you trust. And I think that is one of the, I think, failures of people. They don't trust other people. They don't see the, the value of, of other individuals. And so they try to take on the task their own. And they mm -hmm. fall on their face several times. And once they fall on their face several times, they get their butt hurt. And they're like, yep. I'm, well, I'm not doing that again. I just quit. I, I can't do this. I said, no, you can do this. You do have the ability to do this. And that's one thing I like about Jason. Jason's always encouraged me and, and pushed me. And so is Steve. And <laughs> I like that you, about Jason too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you feel, here's, here's my question. After a, a 30, 30 minute uh, prologue, do it. <laughs> but, my question I can tell I've had an influence on Joe <laughs> that by that prologue alone. My, my, my question is, do you feel that when you have your, um, your sessions or your podcast, 
when you talk to these individuals, do you feel that at first they were excited and then they, they and then they fell down and then they started to realize they need a support group to around them to give them good information or how do they reach that point of you are a good person that I should listen to and seriously, why am I listening to you? You're giving, always giving me bad information. I mean, where does that trigger in their uh, 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 business timeline, uh, which you found out through your podcast? Yeah. So, you know, to that question, you know, when, when do people realize they failed? If, if I'm reading that, that question, like, when do they realize they failed and, and how, what did they do from that? Is that, is that about right? Yes. And at the same time, you know, was there a growth to it or did they get their butt hurt? And they just like, you know what, throw my hands up. I'm too stupid. Or I don't have the ability. I can't lift a thousand pounds and saying, well, if you had a piece of equipment, you can lift a thousand pounds. <laughs> you know, you have to think through it. You have to think, solve, try to solve the problem. Yeah. So, you know, in a lot of conversations, one of the common themes are red flags. These are things that looking back, you're like, oh, well, well, no, duh, this is about to fail on me. I was doing this by myself. Or, oh, no, duh, that this is going to be a problem. I kept on lying to myself, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's always those red flags when you're looking backwards. It's hard to identify those red flags going forwards. So that's been, that's been one common theme. But usually there's some type of you know, crucial moment or some kind of realization or, in a lot of people, health scares. Health scares are a great, great sign that something is wrong. And that, that punctuated equilibrium, that moment of choice, sometimes it happens by yourself or sometimes it happens based on a conversation or with, with somebody, but there is an event. There is a turning point where you look back and you suddenly see those red flags or a decision crystallizes in front of you. And more often than not, most people then bring in their community or they talk to somebody or they get some rationalization because that event was so important that they, they start talking about it and it sheds so much more light and understanding on what those red flags were coming up and what kind of precipitated the change. Um, one, one interview we had was with the uh, uh, chief science officer of an employee engagement company called Limeade. Her name's Laura Hamill. And she was uh, procrastinating doing an executive compensation study. So her company's big, it's got a lot of money in it. And she, as one of the executives was in charge of coming up with the executive compensation benchmarking to make sure that the executives were compensated you know, aggressively to bring in the best talent, but also recognizing the, the equity impact on the rest of the organization. And she procrastinated that task until the, the, the very last minute, like the absolute last minute. She's like, okay, okay, here's it, here it is. And then like finished it there. And that was the moment is that due date of that study, which was very uh, expensive uh, point in time. And then afterwards, she felt the, the, the rise of, of the weight off her shoulders. And she said, why was this such a big weight? And then looking back, the red flags of money always made her feel awkward to talk about it. She felt like she was cutting out certain people by basically pricing their value to the organization. There's all these different factors that were building up that she wasn't able to articulate until the actual act had to happen. And then talking about it with her partner actually on walks was one of the ways that she really recognized that. So she and her husband went on walks and it was COVID. That's all you can do. And those conversations then opened up those emotional red flags that were previously unobserved or did they're just felt it was a cool episode executive procrastination it was our um august 11th episode it's uh, episode eight to uh piggyback on that thought uh as you mentioned that she ended up having communications with her husband and maybe other folks as well when does an individual had i'm just asking through your experience when individuals fail, when they when when do you find out that they actually start reaching out to other people in expertise in a certain area? As you as you point out, she had a, a uh, you know a bad experience about finance or trying to hurt other people's feelings. 
And so she talked to her husband, but you know, uh, some people don't have that luxury. And so maybe we have best friends or, or maybe other colleagues or, or experts in a certain field. When did you find out during the podcast that people is like, okay, I need to stop doing this. I need to go out and reach to other people in these areas so I won't fail again. I mean, wh- have, have you seen that in, in, your, in your conversations or, or just they just naturally pivoted to this because they realized in their minds like, okay, I need this. How, how, how that have happened? Yeah, I mean, everyone's got their own kind of network that they have and they also have their different type of way of, of, of interacting with their network. But hands down, everyone's got someone. So there's always someone there who's in your corner. And, you know, whether that's like a subject matter expert is kind of irrelevant. Like oftentimes that first emotional deal of failure is you turn to the people who are naturally closest to you. It's something that's even hard to pres- prescribe in, in advance. It's just like something really bad happened. And I turned to this one person who was there. That's, I mean, everyone's got someone like that. However, when you want to start making changes or learning a lot deeper, then you go towards more subject matter experts. Maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's a therapist. Maybe it's a a founder who's been there before. One guy that we interviewed, he had an accountability buddy. It was a not a business partner, but a, a business friendship. And he would, you know, hop on calls every once in a while with and just kind of like talk business stuff and like swap shop and swap stories. And um, the person, his name is Brian Williams. He experienced this major medical issue, which uh, none of the doctors could figure out. So he, I mean, he went to the doctors and the doctors were like, we don't know what's wrong with you. You just go home. He eats healthy, he exercises, he goes to church, like loves his kids, all that great stuff. But he had almost a heart attack. And he was talking to that accountability buddy and said, oh, I just had this thing happen last weekend. And the accountability buddy described every single thing that Brian was feeling without even Brian having to tell him because this accountability buddy had been there too. And finding out that this just casual colleague had had the exact same panic attack that Brian had. Now was the first time Brian really heard the term panic attack. And so you'd be surprised the people that are closest to you right now might be better suited than someone who has an official coach title or brand around helping people move through failure. It might be best to talk to your, you know, to your Jasons of the world. All right. Very nice. I want to, yeah, I want to build on that a little bit. So I think that it's true, especially when you're in a startup, uh, on a startup team, I feel like having those huddles, very important. So it's easy to have a huddle when you've scored a major victory. You know, maybe you got funding, Maybe you got an Mm -hmm. investor meeting to look forward to. Hey, maybe like you just brought some more people on the team and you feel like you're going to get some more stuff done. But what happens if like people, if you have a day, like I'll just, I'll just say it. Like we had a day a couple of days ago where we had, you know, a bunch of meetings set up, you know, some people didn't show because whatever, you know, uh, they, they had other stuff going on um, evidently. And so that kind of throws a, a wrench in the works. And then like you have other things that are going on. So having those, all this to say, I would, I would add that having huddles with the people who mean the most to you are what separates you catastrophizing and mm-hmm. going from like, oh, this sucks to like, okay, it's over, everything's over, terminal failure, like, you know, because if you're with people who you trust and who care about you, and you're all kind of like on the same page, you get those different perspectives, but also most importantly, I'm sure you see this too, Dan, you get that encouragement that you know you can rely on because yeah this person and they are truly your buddy yeah i I think intentional community building is great if you've got a purpose to it but it's even better that when things go wrong you've got a network to turn to to help you in ways you didn't expect we all get bad days we all get days where you put on this webinar that you're super excited. I've done this so many times. You put on a webinar, you're so excited, you've prepped, you've practiced, you spent big money on ads and nobody shows up. <sighs> Who do you call after that webinar? That's the network that you want to build in advance. You want to build that community so that when failure does happen, because it's gonna, it's gonna surprise you, it's gonna get you. 
that community is there to catch you, bounce you back up and you move forward and you grow from it. And, and that's part of the resilience piece of failure is that you're not going to go back to where you were. You're going to move past it into something else. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think we've had the opposite too. We've had like, we've had meetings, uh, you know, we've came out of, we did a huddle after and said like, wow, you know, this really didn't work out well. Um, what should we do different next time? And then it turned out, uh, you know, they came on board. It was a big opportunity and yeah. it wasn't a failure. So um, when do you make that declaration that, you know, <laughs> this is a failure, we're going to change something or, you know, just see if it actually works out and, you know, keep pushing forward. So like what separates a red alert from an abandoned ship? In other words, I think that kind of thing. That's actually, you know what, that's a really good question of what separates a red alert from abandoned ship. And I think that space in between red alert and abandoned ship is something that we all control is that we control a lot about how we want to handle that failure. What do we want to do with that? Whether that's an emotional uh, build up the emotional levees of, you know, trying to uh, prepare your community for that inevitable failure. So you pick yourself up and keep going. Or is that a time that you need to do some rigorous data driven analysis to say what specifically broke down in this chain of events? What uh, new hypothesis are we going to generate? And that type of, oh, that takes discipline to like, look at your ugly baby that nobody showed up to or didn't sell and say, okay, let's analyze this piece by piece to find the gap. Where was there an assumption that we had that was not borne out in the data? And that rigor is really what's going to differentiate a successful business that has negotiated a pivot from a business that continues to corkscrew around, is being able to do something between red alert and abandoned ship. And Dan, this is Joe again. Uh, I just came from uh, a conference, and Jason knew about this as well, that that there was a lot of smart people there. And I heard someone talk about AI and I'm not in the AI world. And they said, oh man, we could do all these compilations all at one time. And, so, and I, I'm coming from the, like I said, research and development. If we have, we gone through a process and it fails, we just, okay, let's change one thing. Keep changing one thing, keep changing it. And they're like, oh no, we could change a million things and we'll give you an answer. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Uh, and, and it's really cool that they can come to the same answer faster through this AAR process, which is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, after you fail, or if it, if it you fail, what would you suggest? Should you suggest like, okay, let's try to find the main reason why this didn't work out the way you thought it would be and try to change that? Or would you recommend like, maybe we do a several maybe a handful of small little things and see if it moves out. I mean, which, which solution that seemed to help better? Is it changing one or changing a few at the same time? Or, or uh, what was your perspective on that uh, type of trying to change the ending of the, of the, of the, of your, you know, idea? Thank you. Yeah. I've got a spicy take on that. So um, I think that there's, there's a balance between, iterative development, which is when you make small changes and you learn over time and you know you get the data, you move closer and closer and closer to the thing that works. And then paradigm shifting. So you know if you're in your little microcosm where you're only changing one little variable about your product or your service or your go-to-market strategy, um, unless you have some data, to then indicate whether you're on the right track or off the, you know, off the trail, then you need to be thinking about these paradigm shifts. Shifts. There may be some assumptions baked so core into your assumption, right, right down in that core, that no matter how much iterations you do, it's still going to be a failure business until you shake up the picture and say, "Let's try something completely wackadoodle and, and do that." And I think that balancing the paradigm shifting and the iterative uh, evolution is what's going to determine how quickly you and your business learns the market, learns your product and develops something. AI is in a world because it's so it's so greenfield. The same thing with crypto. Like there's so much opportunity, there's so much happening that 
you need to have that balance because you could throw paint at the walls or you can completely break the internet and try something brand new. Or you can iterate on a small scale and grow and learn and build an engine that then informs how to grow faster and better. Or you just keep playing in the sandbox. You don't do anything great. So you do have to balance those two in knowing that the risks of paradigm shifting all the time is you're just spinning around, throwing paint at the walls. And then the risk of iterative is that you're going to get stuck in your little microcosm, not reimagine the world as you could see it. So and I think both have different interpretations of failures. If you try a crazy idea, it doesn't work. Or you try an iterative failure and it does work. Like Those are different types of outcomes and behaviors uh, that you're approaching that specific experiment around. Does that make sense? Yes. And speaking of experiments, what would you recommend on time schedule? For uh, so should you have a predetermined time and saying, okay, by this time, by this time, whether it be a week or a month or a quarter, if this doesn't change or this doesn't move in a positive direction or this doesn't do something, we need to pivot. We need to do something because it's not working. And uh, but at the same time, if you keep it too short, you know, you know, then it might not work because it's like. Okay, if we would have gave more time, it would have been successful, but we are, you know, we're too jumpy. So Mm -hmm. where's the kind of the sweet spot of, you know, it's like we want to try to find the answer, but at the same time, we don't want to give up the the process. How much time should, you know, uh, and it it goes from different situation to situation. I realize that, but how much time should people should know? I say 90 days. There's still like the most clear cut answer I've given today. Um, so I do, um, I do yearly planning and then I use a quarterly planner and this is mine. I have two more from earlier this year. Um, I like the quarterly planners because 90 days is enough time for you to set a course, set some goals, set some KPIs that you can try to achieve. It can take into account some flexibility. It gives you some variance over the time of year, just to kind of see if it's the time of year that might be the thing holding you back. Um, And then at that 90 day mark, you can look back at your quarter and really see some progress. Uh, It gives you a rudder so that you're not going back and forth every week, but it gives you kind of a, you know, the short-term goal. Now, ideally those short-term goals contribute to that larger yearly picture. And when you're in a, in a place where there's a lot of change, there's a lot of uncertainty, your yearly goals might be somewhat vague or aspirational, but the quarterly goals is when you can translate that into metrics. And then those metrics can inform your decision-making because the end of day 90, you get 10 customers when you thought you'd only get one, something went really right or something went very different. You know, the quarterly level allows you that level of analysis. I think it's great. It's perfect for me. Perfect for me. Yeah, so <clears throat> on the metric side, um... And basically tying into all these goals as well, like how um, how many goals are you looking at at once, or you know how are you tracking? Uh, I guess what do you put into those quarterly goals where you say, you know, I want to achieve this, this, and this, and some might tie together. Some, you know, like for example, uh, if you want to reach out to a certain number of people, you want some of those to turn into customers. Like, how, how are you defining what those goals are? So I use the OKR model, objectives and key results. Um, OKRs are pretty hot right now. So, you know, you can just Google OKR and you'll find somebody who's written an article about it. Um, With OKRs, typically you're looking at maybe two to three quarterly goals, big picture, aspirational objectives. Um, That's the objectives. Um, And that usually doesn't have a metric to it. It usually has some kind of like... uh, future state. It's it's painted a picture of where you want to be, where, which direction you're going in. So that's the O. And then the key results are the actual numbers that indicate that you've reached your objective. So, you know, if you want to develop a sales pipeline that, uh, you know, provides for future growth, that could be your objective sales pipeline. The key results are how many, how many leads counts as having a, a pipeline, how many, 
marketing qualified leads? How many sales qualified leads? How many new customers? What's your deal cycle? Like these are the key results and you can have multiple key results. And those are the things that you're going to attack on a week by week basis. So the objectives are that quarterly goal. The key results are your weekly uh, metrics that are indicating that you've then reached it. And so you stagger that out over the three months and that allows you clear data that you're getting closer to your goals or you're not. And it gives you clarity that you're not trying to do 12 goals. You're trying to just do one or two or three. Um, yeah. So that that's my hot take on, on, on OKRs and, and the types of goals and uh, how you should structure your, your quarters. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I like that. OKRs are sexy right now. A lot of cool tools that can help you with that. Um, I know that a lot of startups are watching this and they may not want to invest in a tool. Uh, so you can certainly do it uh, on a Word document or you know a Google Sheet. But at some point, finding a way that your team can report into uh, your OKRs is going to be critical to ensuring that there's still strategic alignment when you go from the top to the bottom of the organization. So in one tool that I use is 15.5. Use it for check-ins uh, as well as for alignment on OKRs. Um, and they've got some pretty cool modules baked into the tool. Um, but there's plenty of out there. Uh, that's a great one. <clears throat> yeah, I'll have to check that out. All right. Again, uh, speaking of OKRs, uh, I, I, you know, recently just finished an OKR, getting ready to start another one in the future. And, you know, what Jason is always pushing is like, hey, uh, just because you have a fancy toy, if nobody likes it, it's called a hobby. It's not yeah. called a business. And, and so, so uh, that's one of our OKRs. And I try to do uh, customer discovery and talk to a lot of people, over 100 individuals uh, or organizations, directors, and stuff like that. And one thing I liked about the OKRs is, as you said, failures. It's like, hey, I had this great idea. And they're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that's not the response I was looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then you just have to figure out what was the response. And the more, as you said, the more that you talk to people, the more that you get to, to polish your, it's not only just polishing what you're saying, but polishing your product to saying, okay, the, this is what the customer needs are. And so you're trying, as what uh, Jason says, to pivot to get a better product out there that people want to purchase. Because that's, a, that's our goal. We want to put our baby out there and we want it to really make a difference in other people's lives. Now, with that being said, as you mentioned, for quarterly OK, OKRs, and, and this is the first time we ever did it, and probably it went not as well as we hoped, that we had a few goals, but we had weekly meetings and weekly updates. Mm -hmm. and. I think that put a lot of pressure in mm -hmm. trying to, oh, we have to fill these numbers up. And we said we had to do five. And so we're like, okay, we have to hurry up and get five. And I don't think that was the really, I think the quality of our conversations or our quality of trying to get the information was not there. If, mm -hmm. And so would you picture uh, if you ever did another OKR that you should try to keep your goals in mind and it's not how many to get to the goal. Does, does that make sense? Yes, and I, I would I would agree in principle, but I disagree on execution. So I agree on principle is that quality matters. If you're gonna be in business, you can't build a business on crappy processes, crappy outreach, inauthentic marketing. Like you're not gonna build a successful business if excellence isn't, isn't a priority. However, one of the biggest killers to a business is that they strive for perfection, but never ship anything. And I think from a learning perspective, quantity counts. It's taking as many opportunities to get at bat in quality situations, but the number of times, the number of opportunities is going to improve your own ability. It's going to make you better at getting that high quality consistently. So I would say hit those numbers. Like numbers are things that you can achieve for. And it's going to be stressful as you're learning the new skill, as you're learning how to perform at scale. 
my, my partner, she transitioned from higher ed to tech sales. So whew, paradigm shift. Um, and she started as an inside sales rep. And let me tell you, she's on so many calls doing the pitch, doing the demo. And after 50, 100, 150 demos, she kills it every single time. High quality. And you, you can't get there on one or two really well thought out times. No, you got to keep on going in and going in and going in and believing that you will get better, even if it's just a little bit better. The quality is going to get a little bit higher. So, you know, principle, yeah, you're, you're shooting for excellence, but execution, more times at bat means more likelihood you're going to swing and hit well. So, um, yeah, I want to give you a chance to, I know you have a bunch of exciting things coming up. Uh, we have your, you know, podcast release, some other events and, um, and you know, all the services you're offering to startups as well. So what should we be checking out? What's coming down? So, um, of course, the, the podcast is going on. Um, you can listen to that at the 2020 perspective. That's 20 slash 20. You can find that in any podcast player. There's some really killer episodes in there, including I got to interview my dad. I got to interview my intern. I got to interview multiple creativity specialists. Um, and next week we're going to be doing a uh, Facebook live as a season finale, where we're going to just run through all the episodes this season. Uh, so you can find that on the 2020 perspective on Facebook. We'll do the Facebook live and then we'll turn that into a podcast episode, which you can download on your podcast player. Um, uh, I'm on a mission right now as I'm moving into this kind of new phase of learn to scale just to educate people on kind of like what I'm doing and, and why I think it's so cool. So next week, next week being uh, what, when, what day is today being the 19th? Yes. On October 19th at noon, I'm going to be running a workshop on outbound sales 101. So how do you get your numbers up? How to get your personas, right? How to get your messages, right? So that you can generate more outbound sales. You can find that on, and I'll share it's, I think it's shared on the prepare for VC, uh, community. Uh, but it's going to be through Eventbrite. You can find details on LinkedIn, et cetera. I'm just posting on all the social handles. So that's a good way of kind of understanding, you know, what does Learn to Scale do for businesses, but also how you can take some of our best practices and use it for your own outbound lead generation. So those are probably the two biggies that are coming up. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait to share. I'm actually doing a little test run of that, that workshop today at HubSpot's Inbound. I kind of took over a topic chat and said, we're going to talk about scaling your leads. I'll lead a, I'll lead a discussion on this. So I'm going to test drive some of the content today. Oh, awesome. Yeah. A lot of big conferences. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Got to check out the HubSpot one. Um, there's uh, I think the Forbes summits this week as well. And um, a lot of big startup events going on. So it's oh, a good time. Yeah. Cool. Pretty active time. Um, and yeah, as uh, you know, you're active in our community space as well. So um, yeah, we'll share. I mean, it would be uh, it would be ironic if we um, forget to if we fail and forget to put it on YouTube and forget to share in the community. But you know, we want to get this out there to all of our community members. So yeah, we'll definitely be posting in the space there. And um, amazing to have you, you know, as part of our network and as a resource for all of our startups. My pleasure. If anyone wants to talk about their failures, they're more than welcome to talk to the failure guy here. Oh, looks like oh, looks like Joe's got some something else to add. Joe. Yeah. Yeah. We only have like a few minutes left to go. And I just, just want to ask you just one question, uh, Dan, that out of all the podcasts that you had, do you feel that the reason why they're on your podcast is because they did fail and they want to try to be successful? versus having somebody so successful seem, oh man, everything I touch is, man, is great, great, great. Oh, you know, I fell maybe a little bit, but everything just turns great. You know, do you find that most people that's on your podcast have many failures behind them, that that's how, that's who they are today is through their failures? Yes, everyone, whoever, whether you're listening right now, or you know you're watching the replay. 
everyone is a product of their failures. Everyone is. Everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a situation, a conversation that went south, an event that bombed, you know, something. Everyone's got those stories. Our mission when we created this podcast was not to interview the most famous people who are so successful now. And wasn't it cute how I failed? No, that's how I built this. Go watch, go listen to that. Um, this is people who are in the midst of their failures, recently out of it, or you know, they're not like the most important person in the world, but they're removing the 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 filters around failure and saying it's okay to fail like i failed plenty of times too we managed to bring on the guy who who coined the idgaf clothing line like this guy if i don't know if you've seen it, it said idgaf and it became massively popular shack was wearing it and he made no money off of it that he he totally failed in in actually monetizing it successfully we thought we were going to interview him about his travel blog series on netflix He's a travel blogger on Netflix, but he also created an idiot like crazy. People have tons of stories and it's just letting yourself share those stories, which is why the podcast exists, but everyone's got a story. Everyone's got one. Do you follow up that? You, you said something first. And I'm sorry, Jason. I know you get Jason like, Joe, stop. You have to go. But uh, just real quick, you just mentioned that you just talk to these individuals right after failure. How did you find these people after the failure? I mean, is there like a, a Google search? Like if you just fail, put your name in here and I'll contact you. How, how do you find these people that just fail? Let me tell you the power of marketing is you say you do a podcast about failure and someone's like, oh, I failed so many times. And I'm like, well, would you like to come on the podcast? That's how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, just say you do a podcast about failure. Vomit something on you. Yeah, I know there was another um, <clears throat> podcast in the area called Failure the Podcast as well. And like, you know, I was hearing it and thinking like, you know, at first, uh, who's going to come on the show and, you know, share all the, the failure side of it instead of talking about the success. But, you know, there's that, there's yours. There's um another like, there was a big meetup group. I'm not sure how active they are still. Yeah, but... fuck up nights. Yeah, the fuck yeah. up nights. And they closed in Boston because of other issues. But I was about to start that chapter and then COVID hit. Oh, okay. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's like, um, yeah, people want to share their stories, get it out there, help other people. And, um, you know, also you get to see, you get to see them uh, a couple of years from now and, or either they are successful in something else or, you know, they've built on that failure to, to, um, yeah, you know, keep going and improving on everything they're doing. Yep. They just keep failing. You'll, you'll get to the end at some point. Exactly. Just keep going. Well, thanks so much for having me on. This is really fun. I love talking about failure. Um, and if, if you want to connect with me, find me on the community, uh, send me an email, dan at learn to scale us and, Let's talk about you and your failures. <laughs> Sounds good. No, it's <laughs> great to have you on here. Um, and yeah, great questions and uh, no, exciting. Um, yeah, so we'll be we'll be sharing this in the chat, the community, and um, and uh, c- connecting the dots here. Let's connect those dots. That's the Steve way. <laughs> that is the Steve way. <laughs> well, thanks again. Good, but you know, trying to get better at that too. You're good at connecting dots. You're good. All right. All right. Thanks again. Thanks.